Um, I promise I had something a little bit more intellectual prepared, but we decided this would be a bit funnier. Um, so yeah, my talk is about four ways you could suddenly die according to physics. Uh, could I get four volunteers maybe to come up? Uh, no? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to kill anyone today. Not today. Um, so anyway, there are three criteria for all of these scenarios. Uh, the first criteria is it must be instantaneous, so it is a cruelty-free death, no pain. Uh, the second one is that it must be unforeseeable, so we can't see it coming. And then finally, we have possible. Now, you will notice that all of these, while possible, are very unlikely. And I think we can all agree that that's pretty good, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here. So, let's get into the first one. Uh, for the first one, we got to talk about Boltzmann brains. Uh, and before we do that, we got to cover two quick topics from physics. That is, on the one hand, the heat death of the universe, and something called quantum tunneling, which I'm sure many of you have heard about already. So the idea about the heat death of the universe is that the universe, as you may or may not know, is expanding, and it will continue to do so, presumably, forever. Uh, we will eventually get to the state where the universe will be kind of like a clear, boring soup, where everything will just be uniform and it will be so in all directions. Um, and once the universe has entered this phase, uh, and this is important, it will continue to exist within that uh, state forever. And I don't know what you know about forever, but that's a very, very long time. Uh, so, the second thing that we need to cover is this idea of quantum tunneling. Now, in order to understand quantum tunneling well, you probably have to have a PhD in theoretical physics. Do we have anyone here? No, okay. Uh, so, um, for our purposes, what you basically need to understand about quantum tunneling is that it's kind of a version of teleportation. So, any quantum object, any atom, any electron could basically spontaneously, randomly, go from that position over there to a position over there instantaneously, uh, kind of like the, the flick of a switch. Um, so, that being said, uh, a Boltzmann brain was introduced by uh, one Sir Ludwig Boltzmann, um, and basically what his argument was, was, <laughs> I don't even know how to explain this well because it's such a strange idea. <laughs> the idea is basically that a brain is basically just a configuration of atoms, right? It's basically just a very specific configuration of atoms in a certain order. Now, in this heat death universe scenario where the universe is unchanging forever, ever, ever, it is still filled with particles. And these particles can randomly quantum tunnel or teleport into different positions of the universe. Which means it is not entirely impossible, though extremely unlikely, that in this universe, after an incredibly long amount of time, maybe two atoms quantum tunnel next to each other. Maybe three, maybe four, maybe a trillion. Maybe these atoms all quantum tunnel into uh, the same space and exactly in the right order to form a brain. Basically, physics tells you if you have a box and you close that box and you wait long enough and there's enough stuff in there, eventually you'll just have a brain. And that, my friends, is a Boltzmann brain. And not just that, but it is actually has been shown, I believe by Mr. Boltzmann himself, that it is more likely that you are the figment of the imagination of a Boltzmann brain than that you are actually a real human sitting here. Because, again, forever is such a long time. And in fact, one Augustus de Morgan, a theoretical mathematician, uh, actually said, anything that can happen will happen with enough tries. So it is uh, mathematically more likely that we are currently in the heat death of the universe and we are the figment of the imagination of a Boltzmann brain kind of floating through outer space. And of course, you can imagine that that's not a very stable situation. So that Boltzmann brain is pretty quickly going to start falling apart. Uh, specifically, it will be kind of uh, exploded by the negative pressure of space. Uh, so there you go, my friends. The first situation, death by literal brain rot. The <laughs> second uh, scenario in which you might uh, suddenly cease to exist uh, involves primordial black holes. So most of you guys will have heard of the regular type of black holes occurs when big old stars kind of collapse in on themselves, a huge amount of matter located on a single point. Now, primordial black holes are a little bit different. They actually formed way in the beginning of the universe, when the universe was pretty small still, but there was the same amount of stuff in the universe. So you can imagine it was a pretty heavy universe already, pretty small, but pretty dense. Um, and what that basically meant, 
And you can see a picture here. This is technically not actually of the early universe. This is the cosmic microwave background radiation. But the early universe kind of looked like this, where it was basically just radiation, just light, and some bits of the universe were a little bit more densely packed with this energy, with this light. And those bits of the universe, remember the whole universe was pretty dense, those little pieces that were just a little bit more dense could form black holes. And the important part about this is that those black holes come in all, um, all shapes and sizes. It's a very diverse group of black holes. We don't just get the massive ones. Um, and so, it is entirely likely, though not proven yet, that our universe is filled with these primordial black holes, some as big as a coin, some as big as a mountain, some as big as a star. And so, it is entirely likely, again, very, very, uh, very unlikely, but entirely possible that one of these primordial black holes is on a collision course with our uh, planet and will just kind of ram through it. In this case, if you're living in Africa or, I don't know, maybe like Kazakhstan, China, you will be dead instantly. Uh, if you are living in Austria, Saudi Arabia, any one of those countries, you might have a couple of seconds to enjoy some pretty beautiful earthquakes uh, before the core of the earth kind of uh, sucks you in. So that won't be quite as instantaneous. All right, the third and second to last scenario that we have is uh, what's called the false vacuum decay. And personally, I find this one the most uh, scary. So the idea here is that we have four fundamental forces in the universe. We've got gravity, we've got electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force. Uh, most of you guys will kind of have a... Uh, well, a casual understanding, maybe we can say, of gravity and electromagnetism. The two other forces are kind of hidden. You don't really feel them in your daily life. Um, but all forces that you experience in your life are a result of these four forces. Now, it turns out, and we know this pretty much for sure, that in the early universe, all four of those forces behaved exactly in the same way, and so they were one big, grand, unified force, as they call it in physics. Um, and as this diagram shows, as the temperature of the universe kind of uh, started to plummet, and as the universe expanded and cooled, those forces went through something called spontaneous symmetry breaking, where they spontaneously started to act in different ways. Now, we don't know for sure that the universe is done doing this. Uh, it is unlikely because the universe is quite cold already and it's not going to get much colder. But it is, once again, entirely possible, though unlikely, that at some point in the future, these forces will again split up and turn into maybe five, maybe six, maybe seven, maybe eight different forces. And at that point, we will have the true vacuum. So the implication there being that we live in a false vacuum. Um, and so you can see a little diagram there on the right. You don't have to worry about too much. But this is the idea that there can be a false minimum and a true minimum that we haven't quite reached yet. And uh, the scary part about this scenario is that if this happens, then randomly throughout the universe, we'll have like little seedlings. I, I believe they're called... Uh, nucleation events where this false vacuum will suddenly appear uh, and it will spread out at the speed of light which means we won't even see it coming because light travels at the speed of light and so essentially this is probably the most unforeseeable one you will simply be swallowed up by a new universe with different physical laws I hope you are scared so the last one, you guys, is uh, about cosmic strings. So this one, again, comes, from, comes to us from uh, Einstein, no less. So in order to explain that, I can actually give you a bit of an analogy. So we've already talked about this idea of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, where the universe can suddenly kind of pop into a different state, and that state will spread out through the universe. Now, when different phases come together, so for example, we have a picture here where ice is forming, so you can imagine that there's water on the left and on the right, it's starting to freeze, and then those two areas come together. And you can kind of see where the ice met, you have these kind of like thin filaments where you can see that kind of something went wrong, it's not like a perfect crystal anymore, there's some kind of, we call it defect, or topological defect in the ice. And this happens pretty much any time uh, matter or anything else goes through different phases and those things connect with each other. You can have these defects. 
Um, and you can kind of see a picture there in the right side how that happens. So one layer of the ice might have an extra layer of atoms, and then when they come together, they can't do so perfectly, so there's an awkward angle, and then you see that uh, when you look at the ice. And that can happen to the universe when symmetry is spontaneously broken. These bubbles that spread out through space, sometimes when they come together and form a full, uh, true vacuum universe, there might be these topological defects in the fabric, the very fabric of space and time. Uh, and this is a simulation I actually pulled from a science paper where the red dots simulate matter in the universe and the yellow filaments represent the uh, positions where these defects have occurred. Um, and unfortunately for us, if these things do exist, which all the math says they should, they would be extremely heavy and they would travel through the universe at the speed of light. So once again, unfortunately, it is entirely possible, though unlikely, that one of these cosmic strings may just rip through the Earth, may just break it in half, basically because they're so incredibly massive. Um, and if the Earth is no longer there, I, I think we all understand we wouldn't be either. Um, and so that is uh, the last of the four. Um, but I did want to kind of connect it to our topic, you know, beyond borders. Um, when you study physics, and, and I realized this when I was going through my four little scenarios here, um, you start to develop a slightly different perspective. Uh, I think it's, it's best kind of summarized by an interview I saw with an astronaut. Um, I believe it was Neil deGrasse Tyson, actually, who was uh, interviewing. And this astronaut said that when he looked out out of his space shuttle the first time and he saw the Earth, he said he felt something that later he used the words, um, the cosmic perspective. So he said that when he looked at the Earth for the first time, he really didn't just think, but really felt that we were all kind of, well, that we're all kind of in it together, that we're all in this kind of grain of sand floating through space, possibly gonna die any second from a cosmic string. Um, and he used the word cosmic perspective for that. And I, I think when you study physics, you really start to get that cosmic perspective where you see that we're all governed by the same laws, we're all in the same universe, we're all breathing the same atoms that someday will be dispersed into the void. Um, and I want to read a little quote, and that'll be the end of this talk. I'll read a little quote from Albert Einstein, another great uh, physicist and mathematician who came to the very same realization just through thought experiments and thinking about physics and the laws that we are governed by. So I'm going to read it out to you guys. So Albert Einstein, in a letter, once said, A human being is a part of the whole called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection to a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. So thank you very much. I hope you feel connected. <laughs>